So everybody, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, it's a big honor for us. Uh, this is a, a big event for me personally. It's a, sort of a career highlight as far as public speaking goes. Um, this is Eden, I'm Inbar. We're gonna talk about uh, uh, what we call from uh, one country, one floppy to startup nation, a retrospective on the 25 Israeli uh, hacking years from the early days of the community until uh, where we are today. And um, a disclaimer first, because uh, we're gonna be talking about hacking and this is all you know, recorded and everything. Whenever I say I, or whenever one of us says I, it means one of us. And whenever one of us says we, that means uh, the community, okay? Unless otherwise stated, okay? So if I say we did that, then it's not us, it's because here we're speaking for a big community here. Uh, a little bit about uh, us, why we were here. Um, as you can see, I uh, was born in 1975. I got my first computer, was a Dragon 64. It was in 1984. Uh, my first PC was an Amstrad PC 1512. That was uh, 88. Joined the military in 93, like most people in Israel. Left the military 18 years later, went to work for Checkpoint, and then for Perimeter X. I'll let Ed in. So we, we share the Amstrad, and in fact, we actually got to know each other when we were 13, and there was a story about that as well. But before moving over to the dark side of being a venture capitalist, I built Eternity, who I sold to Riverbed, and then Face.com, that if you use face recognition on Facebook, that's us. And uh, why are we here? Every time we meet, we tell war stories. And uh, since we're all relatively old, then we keep covering all, all the time, Free, since the late 80s, early 90s. And we like telling the war stories, and all of a sudden, DEF CON 25 had a theme that said 25 years of hacking. And I'm like, okay, so let's put it in writing, and let's share it with others. Uh, but our story actually starts a long, long time ago. Uh, we're not exactly sure. I mean, I, I started reverse engineering at 14, so that puts it around 1989. Uh, but this is all very vague because we're looking back a long time ago. Um, so some of the people in the story that you'll see during the conversation are pretty interesting, right? The first one, this guy ran the biggest wear site in Israel, One Man Crew. This guy I knew only on QSD, X25, as Dyer Maker. This guy had the BBS along with this guy. And then this... Some people know, but he was just hacking around on the coders channel on IRC. This ran the Lamer Slasher BBS during some lyrics and copyright infringement at Mass. He was, before being arrested three times, he was only arrested once. And that's the two of us yeah. there, basically around those ages. You can notice I still have two hands there. So that's old, that's old. Uh, so why one country, one floppy? The percentage back at the time was, was amazing. It is estimated that 98% of the software in Israel back at the late 80s and early 90s was pirated. And the reason is basically that, why not? Because you can. Most of it wasn't really protected. And uh, we liked the challenge when it was protected. And it was sort of a revolt because software was really expensive back then. I mean, today we, we moved to a situation where what software that used to cost $700 on your PC now costs five or six on your phone. But back then it was a lot of money. And if you wanted to have a lot of stuff, that was very expensive. You couldn't afford it. So the, the Middle Eastern mentality and, and, and a bunch of other things kind of made it clear to us that, no, we're not going to pay for that. We can just, you know, have it. And talking about mentality, and we'll, we'll end the presentation also with this at, uh, at, at some 60 slides for now. So the Israel culture, you need to, just to give you the background, Israel culture is disrespect for authority. That's the biggest, single most thing. Uh, when my son tells me, no, that's not smart, go fill the tub, and I'll, st I'll then stop playing the iPad, I'm actually proud. Right? So, and willingness to fail is a huge thing, and then just... Constantly, and that's what you see most entrepreneurs do. Live today as there might be no tomorrow. That's another aspect of kind of the, the Israel culture. And 
If, if you look at the US, you have a 1% of the population that can write the book. Yes, I will talk into the microphone. So you have 1% of the population in the US that can write the book, and then 99% that actually follow what it's written there. In Israel, 40% can write the book, and then 60% don't listen. So period of time that we're talking about, this is the late 80s, early 90s, um, a great period. And it's a great period because of a few things. The first is, this is the Israeli computer law that was passed in 1995. So at that time, there's no law whatsoever. You can do anything you want. And the second is, um, during that time, the phone system did not have any filters, right? So we could basically do whatever that we wanted. And it was a very, very, very slow internet. So the, this is the logo of the national phone company. Funny as it may sound, it was actually officially formed in 1982 as a government-owned company. And because of being a government-owned company, there was a lot of conflict going there. Not everybody agreed on what they should do. It actually only started operating in 1984. Um, the country was formed in 1948, so you can, you know. The, the, the concept of mess is going to be around this conversation, this, this talk, so... That's one of the things we're gonna show you. Uh, on the right, you can see the uh, token-operated uh, payphones. Uh, these were later uh, switched for uh, uh, plastic cards, but uh, we started with the tokens. On the left, you can see the rotary dial. Uh, everybody had those. And it took a long time before we switched over to tone dial, which is the one you see in the middle. A very long time. And this is gonna come up in this uh, talk as well. Um, Many of the things you will see in this uh, uh, talk are actually from our private collections. We, I wouldn't say we hoard, but we collect stuff from those days. And this is a scan that I actually made uh, five days ago. I actually have the floppies. They were actually working. I just moved uh, four months ago and I hired a company that also did the packing and they put the floppies together with the speakers. So I guess, yes. Yes, uh, thank you for your support. Um, <laughs> so this is about as much as I can get. This is the floppy that we were using to communicate with some of the services uh, of the phone company. Now, before we continue, I want to talk a little bit about terminology because back then uh, it was not exactly as it is today. Uh, we had uh, four common terms when, when we considered uh, the hacking community. We had the hacking, cracking, freaking, and carding. Now, hacking... Uh, was the act of, you know, going into somebody else's system. That's it. I suppose everybody recognizes that. Cracking was the act of removing protections, almost always copy protections. Uh, we copied games. Games came with codes or sheets of numbers that you needed. Uh, we didn't like that. There were some tougher copy protections like laser holes in the, in the floppy. So anything dealing with removing the protection that was cracking, Freaking was any hacking on the phone system, but most commonly to uh, make phone calls without paying. And carding was using credit cards that were not yours. Uh, so here's an example. We start with freaking. As I mentioned before, it took a while before the phone company switched over to tone dial. Uh, when that happened, most of the pay phones were still token operated. So if you brought one of those little devices, this is actually a remote control from all days uh, answering machines with cassettes. So you could, it's a remote controller. You could call home, get the machine to answer you, then you punch in a code, you can check for messages. But this is normal DTMF. So if you just pick up the receiver of the payphone and use DTMF to dial, then you can make a phone call without paying, right? Uh, call waiting. So that's very annoying when you have a modem because uh, it actually drops the carrier tone. Uh, we had a lot of problem with that, and one of the creative solutions we had uh, early in the day, we had uh, call forwarding as well. Well, it turns out that uh, the phone company didn't do any contingencies, and it turned out that you could do call forwarding to your own number. So uh, what happened was that in the beginning, it crashed the phone company. Uh, we have a friend that told us the story. Uh, his trunk crashed. The phone company actually reached out to him, and they fixed it, but the trick still worked later. First recursion. Yeah. So, uh, so we were using phones, and in, in the phones, the first thing that you do is you actually, after hacking it through, but you, you want to do, you want to use the BBS scene. And 
B- you need to realize that BBS, just in general, just the phone cost was immense. It was $3 a minute to call the U.S. from Israel. So everything was, was local. It was a local ecosystem, even though it was a very, very small system. Actually, Bezik, that same phone company, told us and disapproved the importing of 9,600 baud modems because they said they would burn the phone lines. Seriously. So we had to smuggle 9,600 baud modems from the U.S. in carry-ons. The, much like every war, it's a small community, so it's like we have less than 100 people with BBSs, but there are already two groups there, the Excelnet and the ICCA, that fight each other. And this is a hacking, cracking community, so how do they fight? Is they write software in order to crash the other network's hard drives. So the, each of those networks is hiring coders in order to create Viri, so they would crash the other ones because they're starting to take money and they don't want to have competition. On the free side, those same people are now rewriting uh, Z modem, B modem, if people here still know them, just not to report the last CRC because they didn't want the files to be counted. So you would download the whole, the whole file but not report the, the last byte, the last CRC of the byte, and then that wouldn't be counted. So you have a bunch of people trying to hack through, and that creates the first, first uh, instances of the copyright uh, people or the where is software, right? So Lyrics In is by Yaniv Teigman, the CTO of Face.com, the one that sold to Facebook. And he puts in the repository, the, the world's biggest repository of lyrics, but Israel doesn't have not the computer law and very lack, uh, very relaxed uh, also copyright laws. So that becomes the biggest repository that then moves over to the internet. But we still do infighting. So Ultinet and CNET are the two first networks in Israel, and each hate each other for both free, but have different value systems. So they also want the other ones to crash. And so these were the infightings. Um. Another front of uh, fighting was the ANSI uh, screens. These, as you can see, this is one of the things that I found in my repository of all the old stuff that I collected. Um, I don't have an old machine anymore. This was actually, uh, I ran a VM of XP, I think it was, and uh, VDRAW. Who remembers VDRAW? All right, we have some people in the crowd here. So that was the program you used to create ANSI screens, and you could do animation. And the BBS is competed for who has uh, the, the nicer animation or who was making fun of, of the other ones uh, as well. And as Eden mentioned before, the rivalry made it far. This actually says... There's a good amount of Hebrew speakers here, I see. Yes, it says you're an SOB. This is recorded, so I'll be gentle. Um, uh, when you were trying to con your way into uh, improving your download ratio... Or uh, maybe, you know, rewriting B modem. Rewriting B modem or Z modem. Or maybe your username was suddenly associated with the other group, then you received a warm welcome. And so, so you, have, you have many people that are trying to, there's a, a lot of mess going on, and many groups. And so the only option at that point, I'm 13, Ian Barr is 14 at the time, and we meet at my place. And we say, there are too many people, and there's too much fighting going on. What do we need to do? We need to move from the techies world to the organized world. Right? Organized. So the only sensible thing, being 13, is we need to take over the network. <laughs> so how do you do that when you're 13? Uh, you start a council. You convince people that you need a council because there's all this infighting going on. And, but, but obviously someone needs to guard the council, right? So you need an ethics committee. Meet the ethics committee. <laughs> And it's the early intro, how you run company board of directors. Uh, also, some, some of the prominent people at that time, actually the second member of the ethics committee is a guy called Aaron Tromer um, in RSA, the Shamir, the S. So the protege of, of, uh, of Shamir is Aaron Tromer, who was that early participant in the ethics committee. So many of those people started building also more of a community around them. So just to give you a small example of what the community was uh, like back then, Despite the fights, despite the, the rivalries, we were a community, uh, mostly because we were all geeks and we were outcasts to a certain extent, some more than others, but there was a community. There was this feeling that we are all part of a bigger thing. And every now and then we would have uh, CSOP meetings. All the BBS owners would meet at the house of one of the participants 
everybody would go there. We would talk, talk, talk. And then and I would, you know, run things, the ethics committee, whatever. And on one of those uh, meetings that was in the north of Israel, I used to live south of Tel Aviv. And on the way back, we were on the train. And it was a rainy day. It was winter. And the roof was leaking. So we were like three people. We had to uh, switch cars, went to another car. Of course, it was crowded. So we ended up sitting at a table uh, with a beautiful girl and her mother. Now, back then, I wasn't yet able to uh, hit on girls in front of their mothers. That is no longer the case. But uh, back then, it was a problem. I was 17 or 18. Um, so all I could do was try to get as much information as I could. Um, the, the trip ended with me knowing four things about that girl. I knew her first name. I knew what grade she was on. I knew what city she lived in. And I knew the name of her mother. Now, this is Friday afternoon. I get home and I frantically write a message on the echo mail to all my friends in the north. This is what I know. Help me find that girl. <laughs> Within less than 24 hours, I had her phone number. <laughs> Swear to God. Now, uh, sadly, uh, she had a boyfriend, <laughs> which, which does not decrease any of the achievement. And uh, as a little anecdote, I actually uh, found her on Facebook um, a few weeks ago, and apparently she remembers the story, and they actually tell it in the family. So uh, it was kind of fun. <laughs> so, so feed on that, echo mail, right? Remember, the thing that actually calls in every night in order to pull email from another node. So this is, this is not the internet. This is not even least lines. There were calls made multiple times through the night in order to push email towards a certain direction. But we wanted to go global, right? We, we didn't feel that it makes sense for that small 200 people community in Israel to, to stay dormant there. So if we're stuck in our little pond, how do we go global, right? And just to frame the reference is this is the history of uh, the involvement of the speed of the internet in the U.S. Uh, and pretty staggering. Uh, in 1994, you, you only had about 50 kilo BPS, uh, 90, 80, 80, 84, 86 is already still a bit the same speed, another link, 91 already at, uh, I think it's 65, and then 165 in 94. So, to frame that, this is Israel, right? 89, Bezek, that phone company, informs Machba, that's the backbone of the internet in Israel, that they're not able to provide 56 kilo BPS uh, to the US for at least the next 10 months. And so um, they do the backup and they do a 9.6 kilo BPS to the US. Wonderful. 91, Bezek gets an order for 64K to Europe. Seven months later, there is that first line to Europe. Then just 92, 92, the first ISPs happened in Israel. Up until that point, the only way to get onto the internet was hack into the universities or be a student. Uh, and the second is be part of the multinational. So 92, first ISPs, 95, the first bankrupt ISPs. Uh, 93, the line to the US has been upgraded to 128. Wonderful. So. We need to take uh, care of ourselves. So one of the, uh, the things that we wanted to do was, uh, you know, meet other people. And CompuServe was one of the leading platforms back then. I don't know how many of you remember that. And CompuServe was a paid service. So uh, it turned out that in order to access CompuServe, you can sign up for a temporary uh, account. You need to uh, give your credit card number and a billing address. And you get a temporary account for, uh, I think it was what, 30 days? 30 days. 30 days. And after 30 days, you start uh, you know, being charged for that. It turns out that when you enter the uh, credit card information, it doesn't get billed immediately. What they do is they just check the uh, uh, Loon Mod, Mod 10 uh, formula. So if you're, you take a credit card number, a valid credit card number, and you make some alterations, you can still generate a card number that doesn't exist, but validate the formula. So what we would do is we would make up credit card numbers and then get an account for 30 days. 30 days later, when they figured they couldn't charge the account, they closed it, and then we repeated that again. Yeah, I, I think at one point we were the largest consumers of uh, the uh, evaluation 
accounts of CompuServe in the world. Oh, and eventually CompuServe deleted or canceled the reverse billing because when we were accessing CompuServe, we weren't paying. So they stopped that from Israel. <laughs> yeah, what a surprise. But, and you laugh, right? This is 25 years back, but um, a very good friend of mine, Sam Lesson, um, had started his company called Finn just recently as, as of last year. And he, for the alpha, he went to his friends. And he said, hey, would you want to test it out? But I want to see that you have, I want to see that you have value. And so I'm asking for credit cards from the get-go. And I'm thinking, oh, I know Sam. Uh, he's an MVP type of a guy. Okay. He probably didn't implement the billing code just yet. Uh, he did do the CRC check. You reverse the last four digits. You reverse the two, the last two groups. Works. And maybe I'll use this stage to apologize to Sam that I haven't been paying for the past year. Uh, but it's a great service. Try it out. Another way to call uh, BBSs in other countries was using calling cards. Back then, uh, you would get a card that was loaded with minutes. You would call uh, a number of an operator. A person would pick it up. Um, you would give them the number. And many years later, it was already all with touchstone. But back then, you actually spoke to someone. You said, hi, this is card number 12345. And he said, yes, uh, where should I connect you? And you, you would give them a number. It turns out that some of the people that were operators, and I just put AT&T because that's the image I found, but I'm pretty sure this was correct for other uh, carriers as well, uh, they would make a note of the calling card number and then later share it with their friends. So people were making phone calls uh, on somebody else's expense. Now, back then, OPSEC was not a term yet. We didn't know anything about that. and we used uh, those things to call BBSs, friends. I mean, if anyone had investigated that, that wouldn't be a big uh, challenge because it's all traceable. But back then, there was no awareness on any of the involved authorities. Okay, so I guess you can say we were taking advantage of the situation and we were kind of lucky. I don't for, so it's a story we didn't intend to share, but I, I totally forgot that. So what you could do, you, you'd call this toll-free number, uh, say AT&T, right? And you'd give them a calling card number, and they'd say, well, that's, that's an invalid number. And there was a different prefix for the MCI ones and the AT&T ones. It's like, oh, 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 you're right. Can you transfer me to MCI? And they said, sure, and they transfer you. And then in MCI, you just said, uh, can you just bill me? And that'd be billing AT&T, because AT&T transferred the call, uh, which that, that worked for a full two months. Uh, so, uh, and so you, you, you kind of remember these things after a while. Uh, so no filters meant, meant the obvious thing, right? You, you all know Captain Crunch. Um, so $3 per minute is just too expensive, so what do we do? Uh, if, if we do do blue boxing, there are two things. A is cheap, meaning zero, and then it's also untraceable because you, you hoop between multiple switchboards. And so what you see here, this is the CA, CCITT doc. CCITT 5 uh, still had in-band trunking, in-band signaling. So you basically you would call up a trunk, you'd call up a number, and you could signal the trunk. Initially just the 2600, then 2426. So it, it went on to multiple combinations, but what, what you did have is people that are willing to um, borrow books from the different switchboards. So you'd, you'd know the different signalings that they were using. So this is 92. See the dock? Far, far, far after the U.S. did not have blue boxing working. And in 92, what you see there is a call out to Amos Kilon. Amos Kilon was the runner. He was a sysop of... Uh, Net One, which was another big wear site in Israel. So an, a, a Moskelon is supposed to, it's just a name in Hebrew. It's like Justin, right? So years later, I finally realized I can't find a Moskelon. Uh, so that was an alias. But for a while, it, it was not that clear. So in 92, he was leading the blue boxing in Israel. And basically, mid and South America uh, were controlled by the Israel freakers. So Cuba full control uh, for a very long time. There was no, uh, for two, three years, you would call the 177 number, which is the 800 number that would get you to the operator over, over there, and you could signal at that point, and from that point on, you are a switchboard yourself, and you can call basically anywhere. So other than the actual calling, 
of uh, BBSs, there was a pre-internet network that was called the X25. It's a packet switching uh, data network that ran across the entire uh, world. And every country had its own uh, prefix. Uh, here you can see a list of uh, country prefixes. Uh, Israel was uh, 4251. Funny thing is there was very little in Israel that was using that and in any case, if it was in Israel, we didn't, use, we didn't need X25 to access it. So we didn't actually remember that this was the code for Israel. We do remember uh, other networks in the United States, for example, 3106, uh, 3110. And that was the pretty much equivalent of, uh, of IP address. It was called the uh, NUA, Network User uh, Address. And the most, I think, prominent, uh, I guess you can call it site, because back then it wasn't called that, it uh, was uh, QSD. QSD was a chat server. Hey, anyone here remembers QSD? Anyone was on QSD? All right. Yeah. Shout out for you guys. So QSD was a chat server in France. Uh, something like IRC, a little bit uh, more sophisticated at the time. And everybody would hang out there, uh, talk to one another. Uh, that was the trading arena. You would uh, find people, uh, you would trade stuff with them. You would get codes uh, or whatever it is that you were uh, trading. And this is the NUA. We remember that by heart. Um, wake me up at 2 a.m. I will recite that number. And uh, yeah, that, most of what we did revolved around QSD. And these are... Um, what about NUIs? That was really simple. Okay, NUI. So this is not in the presentation, but we're going to uh, talk about that. Thank you for reminding me, Adam. NUI, the network user identity, is how you logged on to the network. And back then, uh, in Israel at least, there was a, a number, a dial-up number, you would call it. I think it was like 133 or 135, something like that. And then you had to log in. And there was no login and password. You know what we, guy, what we call today two-factor authentication? That's a three-factor authentication. You have a name, and you, or a logon, and you have a password, and then you have another thing. Back then, it was just a logon. And we uh, discovered that some of them had a pattern. Uh, so we wrote uh, scripts over some of the uh, telecommunication programs, such as uh, Telex or uh, Procom, Procom Plus, if you remember those, uh, Telecom. And we enumerated on logins because we figured out what the prefix was, which was nbezek, and then a code, a six-digit code. And it turns out that these codes were actually technician codes. So no one was being billed for that, and no one ever found out about it. Um, so that's uh, one part of the story. And what you're seeing now is a list of uh, out dials. These were actually um, modems connected to the X25 network. They would have an NUA. And when you connected to them, you ended up having a terminal of a modem which enabled you to dial a local number. So the list that you see in the bottom, those are local out dials. There was one for every area code in the United States and probably other places as well, but back then the United States was where everybody was looking up to. And you can see that for every area code, you had a couple or sometimes even four out dials uh, changing in connection speeds. And we also had global out dials. These were actually modems that had an international phone line. Now, till this very day, I have no idea who was paying for that because local, local calls back in the US were not being charged. So I can understand why someone would put a system and connect it to the entire world. But a global out dial was a modem that could call anywhere in the world. Uh, one of the things that we could do with that, for example, is uh, call Israel or harass neighbors or, you know, whatever. Uh, in bars being too nice to Bezek. So the first codes were nbezek 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. That's code number one. Code number two was two, three. So these died fairly quickly. The other ones, less so. Um, so, so that was kind of X25. How does the internet look like from the eyes of the 13, 14, 15 year old kids at the time? Because you remember, we don't have any internet. Right? We, don't, we can't buy an ISP account. So this logo is the logo of the Technion, the Israeli Technion. It's located in Haifa. It's very similar to, the, to MIT. It's uh, fairly highly regarded. Um, one of the less regarded things uh, there was security at the time. So if you wanted to postpone a class you had or uh, that the filing of homework, uh, you could just crash T2. T2 was the 
students uh, system, but this T2 was actually much worse if you think about security. So at one point, it was clear that uh, bin login was actually modified, that it would accept the password fuck you for any user, including root. <laughs> so just to preserve the rights on, on that computer. Then interestingly, new users, right, new students, how do you set passwords for new students? Nobody knew how to do it. And so what they decided on is hash. So they hashed on their ID number. So your student number was S and then an ID number. And then your default password was a hash on it. They also did not want to publish the results of tests in an identified manner. So they had very big filings of them with the ID number of the student and the mark he got. So you'd go up a bus. It's a two, it's a one, two hours ride. You take photos, analog pictures of the student marks. You go back, you hash it out, and you have the passwords for any student on the T2. Yes. Uh, so I wish that was the security. To, I, I could tell you this was uh, a really bad security at the time. But Mashbil Merkazi, this is like the Sears of Israel. All right, so Sears, fairly large chain, Mashbil, um, on their primary computer, on the primary computer system, they had root root. And somebody found it out, which is fine. So they were dialed, and they found the dial-in for that computer, and they got scared. So they posted the number for the Mashbil Merkazi, the, the central computer, they posted it as a BBS on a BBS list. And the reason was to have other people discover that root root is possible and basically cover their tracks. <laughs> so, and for a full year and a half, it was listed on a BBS, on one of the BBS lists as a open BBS for the community. And I mentioned that uh, one of the ISPs uh, went bankrupt, 95. So that ISP is called DataServe, obviously no longer with us. The CEO of the DataServe was called Gil Bin Noon. His password is IMGBN1. Maybe we should apologize uh, years later. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is, how was that discovered? Just remember the old days. It was slash dev slash knit. You could listen in on the network interface, and that was clear text being posted. So that sort of was, was absolutely open for, for a fairly long while. So uh, how did we learn? Back then, there was an internet. We actually had to buy books uh, and sometimes wait for them for a long time because you went to the store, either it was there or you didn't know it existed. Uh, the thing on the left, you see Machshevet, those were very elementary books. I think many of us started our computer uh, education there. That was mostly basic and sometimes uh, Logo and Pascal. Uh, I learned assembly language from the book in the middle uh, and Pascal from the book over there. And that led rather quickly, at least with the curious guys, to reverse engineering because we wanted to know why things happen, how they happen, and how we can modify them to our benefit. Uh, one of the reasons we did that was to contribute back to the community. There was also a community back then, if you guys recognize this, this is the Ralph Brown interrupt list. Back then this was like the holy grail of interrupts uh, on the 8086 platform. And uh, I made some contribution, I would reverse engineer my BIOS, I don't know why I did that, um, but I did. And then uh, one day, Eden comes to me, uh, already back then he was delegating, and he said, Ambar, how about you write uh, a piece about uh, anti-debugging tricks? And I actually did, um, not entirely by myself, and actually th this can be found all over the internet. Um, back then we didn't think that you know, the stuff was gonna be recorded, but complete archives of emails and echo mails are somewhere to be found. And this is all over the internet, and we have an exclusive, we're gonna release the sixth edition that was never actually published, uh, I actually found it uh, in my stuff. Now reverse engineering was not only code. Uh, these are two games by Microprose. I liked flight simulators. My dad used to be a pilot. And it turns out the uh, engine on these two games is identical, which means that all the data files are identical. Now, they didn't have the same um, places you could fly. Right, one of them had the Persian Gulf, and the other one had, your, uh, I don't know, uh, South Africa, and you wanted to do both. So we figured out that you can just copy the files and then enjoy all the arenas in the same game. 
So games were, were a major part of growing up, much like everyone here. And this guy has, is one of the biggest contributors to that in Israel. This is, I showed this picture initially, Asi Azulai, One Man Crew, the really zero day, the original zero day <laughs> meaning of it, which is these are the latest wares that you can find. And that was on, on, on his BBS. Now, the problem is, or the thing that was really annoying, is that he was putting in intros, demos, before the games that he was distributing. And that was really annoying, right? So, uh, just to take credit. So, we, we instrumented the code and found which bytes to change to a jump and just to get rid of that. And, and that started a war. And, well, here I can say we. That, that's this kind of a we. Um, so, we found how to, to reverse engineer that and, and remove that code, but then, they added self-modifying code and encrypting uh, the intro, which was a real bummer. So what we did, if people hear code assembly, uh, we actually captured int 10. Int 10 is uh, transfer the changing to mode 13, which was the VGA mode, because they needed that to do the demo. And we just sent failure. So never mind how they, he encrypted the code, never mind what they did, the demo just wouldn't come up, come up. And as soon as then the game goes and does mode 10, mode 13, and in 10, fine. Yeah, go ahead, let's play the game. And we called it, as you can see, an Asi. <laughs> now, uh, Asi wasn't the only one using uh, uh, file uh, compressors. There were many of them. You had ICE and uh, uh, PK Lite, and some of them had versions that didn't have extractors. And one of those was Tiny Prog. Tiny Prog um, was uh, created by uh, Alex Robinson, and there was no decryptor for that. So uh, I wrote one, uh, also not entirely by myself, and it actually worked. And back then, when you contacted someone, it was by sending them a letter. I actually found a guy, his company was called Transoa. I sent him a letter, and he kindly asked me not to uh, give the source away. He said, this is how I make my, uh, my income. Please don't spread it because people buy the product and I wanted to keep working. And I, uh, I actually agreed. And at a certain stage... <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, um, I was cracking games for a living. I actually played uh, Larry Sweet Larry, uh, VGA edition. Um, so, but, so Tiny Prog was a problem. And so Inbar was visiting me one day and I found the source code and I copied that over. Um, Stole it, you mean? Yes. Well, copying. Zero cost. Um, and then the, the, the crazy amazing thing is that we did have the relationship in place for him to, just before leaving, say, I just want to run something on your computer. And he did a find to the file size, the byte file size of Untiny Prog and found it on my drive. Oh, so, but, but that did start a fight, right? So... A friendly fight. A friendly fight. So uh, this is um, a crack for a uh, software called Olin. Olin was the primary typewriter in Israel at the time. And they had a really good protection system. Um, it was actually a parallel port driver that you'd, you'd put in. And it had part of the challenge response. It had part of the code in it. And so because Inbar was refusing to give me tiny prog on tiny prog, so I wrote open all. OpenAll was an x86 virtual machine that would listen, that would emulate the running of the software, find when to capture the executable, but also um, log the parallel port. Hence, uh, the crack to Olin. The interesting thing, like we, we found all these while doing the research uh, for this, the, the interesting thing is, I guess you all know FRAC. Right? That's uh, one of the holy bibles. Uh, and Herd Beast, who I have no idea who that was, wrote a summary about the Israeli scene. Now, if you look back, see, this is Ford Prefect, that was me, Hasp was my group, and Frack is talking about, for the sake of the pirates, an Israeli foreign group that also has American members is called Hasp. Hasp was a group of one. <laughs> no American members whatsoever, but I did have a Frack mention. <laughs> Uh, so, so from, from all those cracking, uh, started a new community called the demo scene in Israel. It was mostly in Europe. There, there wasn't much of a demo scene in the U.S., which is interesting. And um, at one point, I became the coding coordinator of ICE, the insane creator enterprise, which up until that point, we're just creating ANSI. So we were the first VGA 
coders on that platform. And you see that he's actually crediting three Israelis that joined uh, the group at that point. And this is one, uh, Tom Tzalfati, one of the best engineers I know to this date, and an entrepreneur in a, in a group called Simply. This is Nitzan Shaked. He now uh, is one of the leaders of uh, uh, what was Yahoo uh, in Israel. And that was me. But the interesting thing is that we were clueless at the time that there was another group or a group of people. There were about dozen, uh, two dozen people that were doing demos in Israel, but we we're not communicating with one another. So these people are, are awesome engineers to this date. And this guy is one of the best mod and S3M trackers to date. And he's part of a group called Infected Mushroom, if people know. Yeah. yeah. So that was the demo scene, right? It's, it's pretty crazy seeing that from the guy, Erez Eisen. Uh, the virus scene was a very uh, uh, interesting place to be in the 90s. And Israel did play a role also in the virus writing, um, let's call it scene. Uh, the most famous uh, two are the Jerusalem and the Haifa. Remember, we're talking back then, there was a distinction between a virus and a worm and a Trojan. So these two, there were some local initiatives. People wrote um, uh, malware to uh, inject uh, cuss words into uh, uh, their uh, school computers. But most of what we were doing in Israel was actually on the good side. Uh, if you look at the antivirus history, you can see that uh, a lot of companies were actually based in Israel. One of these companies, uh, one of the writers, Gilad Yafet, is the uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, MyHeritage, uh, one of the largest uh, genome mapping uh, companies, was it? Um, so some more collect uh, from my collection, these are actually floppies of uh, AVs. This one is by Iris, and we had uh, VirusSafe as well. And there was actually one that was uh, written by two guys, Yuval Tal and Uzi Appel. Uh, you can see on the right, uh, Yuval Tal writing in one of the Ecomail channels that he's looking for some assistance. And then Uzi Appel joined the military, so I was called in to replace him. So for a while, I was actually writing uh, uh, AV engines, and that was 92. And an interesting story, the Haifa virus, I actually found it on my uh, school computer. And it was the first, or one of the first, that was self-encrypting, self-modifying. It was very, very advanced uh, at the time. And I did a complete reverse engineering of that. And I hope you can see what it says. I'm, I'm so... Uh, so proud of myself. Uh, just read the first sentence, really. It's pure gold. And um, uh, I, wrote, I created the generic signature and I sent it to the AV company. And the interesting story is that uh, not so many years later, I ended up uh, serving in one of the units in the military and one of my colleagues uh, admitted that he was the guy who wrote the virus. So it's a small world. This is the signature. It was uh, very interesting. Now, as far as carding goes, I'll just say a few words. Um, there were two big engines called CBI and TRW. They had a lot of credit information. They were completely unprotected. Many people had access to that and they shared that. There was some ethical line in Israel between you know, getting information and trading it and actually using it. Using other people's credit card, uh, credit card was frowned upon. And let's also talk about uh, some uh, famous busts. Deri Schreibmann, he was the first uh, casualty in Israel. He was caught back in 91. It was the first time that the police actually tackled this whole thing that we were doing. Uh, it was said that he had technology that was never seen before by law enforcement. We had the, the analyzer. Uh, this guy didn't learn from his mistakes and actually fell back into crime a number of times. And someone told me this week that he might actually be uh, uh, in custody as we speak. This is a story from Eden. Yeah, it's, uh, so this guy was caught because he put a Trojan on his ex-wife's machine who then suspected because he had information that he shouldn't have had. Interesting story, but then that actually blew up and it, apparently more than eight different private investigators in Israel used the same Trojan in order to steal data from the largest corporates. So by him being stupid and putting it on his ex-wife's computer, he actually destroyed his own business, which was selling it to law enforcement, to, to private investigators. And the last one, a uh, guy from Ashkelon, this is actually a minor. Uh, this, this happened in the States. He was making bomb threat calls, got arrested. 
Uh, recent history, many of these people ended up in uh, military intelligence. Uh, the pioneer generation actually brought the knowledge with them. The younger ones picked it up there. And Checkpoint was the first companies that was founded based on stuff that people learned in the military. This happened in 93. And you can see a long list of companies that were formed by military colleagues, people who met in the army and had comradeship and they shared you know, work and knowledge and, and they trusted each other. And this brings us to uh, where they are now. Yeah, so it, we, we go through this whole story and then let's see. So this is one man crew, right? He's now running a big IT shop, nothing big. Guy just sold his company two weeks ago for, to Simantech for $250 million. Liol founded the company, which I was fortunate enough to fund and was the CTO of Get before that. This is actually in Bar's ex-boss, uh, who runs Perimeter X. Yair went off to found ICQ and then Dotomi, and he now runs uh, AppCard. Uh, Yaniv L. Slasher, the guy with all the lyrics, uh, is one of the top AI researchers now at Facebook. He was my co-founder at face.com. Um, the analyzer got caught again and again and again and in jail. Uh, Demi, uh, Derry is actually running Hola. If you use a VPN, the free VPN, uh, hugely, hugely scalable, which is pretty crazy. And Erez, well, Erez is with... Uh, Tara Reid. Tara Reid. So it, it, it comes to show was. you that... It, oh, it was? See, we're not up to date. Okay. Sorry, apologies. But the musicians always get uh, the good stuff. And that's it. Uh, this, this book happened. Uh, that's why everybody knows the term startup nation. That's the Israeli culture. Disrespect for authority, willingness to fail, live today as there might be no tomorrow. That's the culture. And we're 32 seconds off. Thank you. Thank you.